I'm going to read from a novel in progress, which is such a weird thing to do, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to read one chapter in three sections. <clears throat> How? My first question upon waking elsewhere, not in my cottage, not with trees shielding or rain tapping or the morning chill before I've laid the fire. I smelled bleach, and I wondered if Sister Juana had been trying to clean my walls again. It was warm, perhaps she'd already lit the wood stove. But after, chlorine smell came antiseptic, then plastic, and the plastic was in my nose, cool air whistling its way inside me. Why, I wondered. And then where? I could not see, not really, not quite. I couldn't move but for a flutter of a hand. Something constrained me, my body wooden. It frightened me more than the abnormality of it all, the mechanical sounds, the many voices muffled, just out of reach, and not my sister's voices. I thought I'd woken in some bad dream that had stuck, and of course I had. Slowly I began to focus. Ceiling, not my ceiling. Bed, not my bed. And Manny, dear old Manny, the only familiar thing in the room. How? I kept trying to say, where? This made him quite unhappy, poor little fellow, and he took off his cap and put it back on the way he does when flustered by the tractor's impudent gearbox or a crop gutted by worms. <laughs> you mustn't, he said over and over, and when I'd clearly tired of that, shh, shh, this is the problem with men, even lovely old gentlemen like Manny. They always say we mustn't when we must. A brown-skinned woman wearing a man's wristwatch came to the bed, tending to the contraptions around me, and I understood finally that she was there to care for me, that I was paralyzed and mute, and probably lying in a hospital, in a city, for there are no facilities on the island. And I realized why Manny was upset, not that something calamitous had happened to me, but that I was there. He knew I'd rather be with the trees. It had been my time and I'd been plucked from it. The woman spoke to Manny, not to me. They talked at length, gravely, but I couldn't make out what they said. I slipped around in time, drifting. Here I was, lying in a hospital half dead. Here I was, a young girl in the rail yards, covered in sticky juice, batting at clouds of fruit flies. Here I was, beneath my husband, beneath the stars, sensing we were not alone, that a spirit hovered, waiting for an invitation. Yes, I said, sending Alberto into spasms of pleasure. Please, I said. And it was done. The Unbearable Hope of New Year's Resolutions. Nothing I resolve to do is listed under Popular New Year's Resolutions on the USA.gov website. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise, get out of debt, drink less, that's what our government suggests. <laughs> Does having New Year's resolutions make you more American? When you promise to do something, are you part of empiric overreach? No one tells you that resolve is simply a winning streak. You believe in it and it goes along until it doesn't. Then there you are at Burger Master or the French Bakery or in bed or knee deep in treats with no farm raised food or time alone to read real books. New Year's resolutions brought to you by capitalism. <laughs> Do you mind if I say the word capitalism, implying thereby that you are under the market's power, self-made in your delusion? Me too. <laughs> Second week of January, I'm pulling tarot cards in the morning. Today's magician and sister of cups slide from the deck and I'm hoping for vegan food, recycled plastics, meditation, <laughs> and kindness to the unkind. But I am, perhaps like you, a self-promise or two behind. My I will do this blurts end up tossed under the bus, flipped to the rails, torn in the engines, flouted by oncoming roars. Let's blame the cards. An Emily Dickinson tarot. 
not the best to inspire a person to go out of her room. <laughs> Outside, a gritty whip of sand locks the sprocket, and the wheel of your life as it is seizes up, leaving you with the bit in the bob clacking and the stumble flip of the winning streak. Dissolution. I wish the wash of nebula, the sky could hold all of this. Intention, resolve, residue, here, sent, wish by wish, Emily by Emily, right up the flu. Oh. The next time I woke, I was propped up, not sitting, but not lying flat. I could move my head enough to see my feet and legs beneath the blankets, though they didn't feel like mine. I needed to pass water, and I couldn't hold it, but when it let go, nothing happened. Trickle, trickle, I heard and shuddered. A tube had been placed inside a part of me I would rather not anyone else see, much less muck about in. Sickened suddenly and more aware now, I'd been laid bare all this time, naked to whomever, whomever was near. Were any of the others here with Manny? Had I come so far with my secret, only to have it revealed in this manner? I turned my head as far as I could in one direction, for it would only go in one direction, and saw my withered old arm, barren but for tape and tubes and reminders of my past, smudged and faded. This would not do. Hello, I yelled, but the sound was not a word. Nurse, I tried. Behind me shushed footsteps, then the shock of my life. How is it so, I cried. Before me stood my dead husband, but he was as young and beautiful as when we first met. Shh, he said, and I became angry. Of all people, I did not want Alberto to shush me. But then I noticed a mole on his neck where my husband had none. Then the cut of his cheekbones was not quite right. Oh, what a lunatic old bat I had become. It's okay, hun, he said, and his lack of an accent confirmed it. My name's Edward, and I'll be taking care of you today. I wanted the woman from before to attend to my very personal needs, not this handsome young man. Nurse, I said again, not the sound at all that I intended. He ignored me, fussing with the tubes and such, adjusting things with the greatest of precision. Everything looks fine, sweetie. We'll get you sitting up a little later this morning, okay? Well, everything was not fine, not at all, but how to convey my displeasure. Everyone in this place seemed to think they could just ignore my wishes. The young man leaned over, and I could see that he was checking a container of urine, my urine, as casually as I might check the rain gauge of a summer morning. Oh, this would not do. This would not do at all. I had never been one to complain, not unless it was important, but complain I did, loudly. I had no language, but I still had some oomph in me, and I told him in no uncertain terms that I did not appreciate my body being violated without my knowledge, that I wished to have all of the tubes removed and let the cards fall where they may. If I had to lie in this bed, in this place, the least they could do was dress me in bedclothes appropriate to my age, stature, and vocation by God. The man looked concerned, <laughs> then alarmed when I would not shut up. He pressed buttons and called out, and then more people were in the room, including Manny, holding his hat. And I was crying, even though I never cry, not in front of anyone anyway. And Manny began to yell at them. Ah, good old buckaroo, I said, a name I liked to call him when he was getting worked up. And he stopped and looked at me. With great displeasure, I glanced at my arm, and he nodded. He hollered at them some more, gesticulating, red in the face. <laughs> Such a dear old friend. I felt safer now and relaxed back into the pillow. And before I knew it, I was waking again, this time dressed in a proper nightgown with long <laughs> sleeves. Now able to move a bit more, I tried lifting the sheets to see what they'd done to the rest of me, finding no evidence of any kind of tube other than the one still in the back of my hand. I relaxed. I wanted to thank Manny, but found out later that he'd gone back to the island. Seems once he saw I still had some fight left, he gave me over to God. He'll be all right for now, I thought, but who will help him come spring? We were old, but we still tended the trees largely by ourselves. I had to content myself with the knowledge that he was far younger than I, only in his 70s, and that he'd find someone somewhere to take over for me. Of this, I was certain. My time in the orchards was over.
recent findings. Domestication syndrome in animals softens their ears and makes their jaws smaller and tameness ensues. I turn to this data when choosing a man to date. <laughs> Hard jaw, pointed ears, a set of balls like doorknobs, a hunter. That's my next move. No more tame, arty men who distinguish subtlety, who love nuance. Just a truck-thrusting, big-shouldered he-man who doesn't talk much. A propensity to sitting up high and something that makes a loud noise. A willingness to empty a reservoir if there's a Harley at the bottom. <laughs> Capuchin monkeys are not deceived by luxury foods, but they have other irrational economic behaviors. I think of never buying clothes again. Acquire power and your speech will become high and loud. Some shrill people next door are yelling about resorts while standing in the parking lot. Rhesus macaques exhibit beliefs in winning streaks. How innate. See how data and date are just like each other? <laughs> Loneliness is a, is a disease. Ta-da! In Maine, bear baiting works out fine with donuts. <laughs> Fry whatnots and roll in sugar. What I've sworn off, I now embrace. Less catch, more release. More barbs snipped from hooks. Quick wrist in the cast, less ambition reeling in. Let narrative be the naysayer of the input-output chart. I'm out to whittle the wash, trim the loads, and dredge the liars from our midst. Expectations, resolutions, as you know, sag and deflate. Here, put your glasses on. Data shows itself the man. <laughs> Words, worse, flotsam, not words at all. 70 years I had the ability to speak to my beloved, but I didn't. I wanted to send my words on a telegraph wire, a phone line, inside an envelope. That would have been selfish. I made do by whispering to the trees. Words were, were I to remember. My memory always too sharp a knife slicing through palm as well as fruit. The first thing I ever remembered, veering through space and time, bathed in a warm glow, moving forward. The end of the memory is pale and gray, a shock to the system, a realization, this is it, you have arrived, and it's cold. My mother made no bones about the fact that I was just plain wrong, that babies don't remember things, especially not the moment they're born. I was a fanciful child, she said, and good children were not fanciful. They kept their minds and mouths shut and did as they were told. Hmm. Fanciful, maybe, but I was also dutiful. I never said another word about the things I knew to be true, like that moment I entered this particular world, or the fact that she was not my mother, but a cousin of my mother's, who was dead, pale and gray, cold. I remember that, too. Vilma took me in because she wasn't completely inhuman, but never had children of her own. There was too much work to be done just to survive. She'd inherited the orchard, and she'd inherited me. She married the first man who could outwork her, and their lives were set forevermore. My dutiful nature was put to good use. I hauled pails of water from the river before I'd even started school, and was sorting fruit by the age of seven. My responsibilities grew, climbing ladders, pinching buds by nine, netting trees, helping with harvest by 10, until I was able to figure out how to escape and survive on my own. At 14, I hitched a ride into Wenatchee and got work in the Great Northern Railway Apple Yard Terminal. It paid just enough to board at Mrs. Snickley's with umpteen, umpteen other girls, like me, who had to find their own way. It was 1935. If you've read your history books, you can probably figure out that wasn't the best time to be young female and on your own. Truth is, it never is. <laughs> We're so easily bruised at that age and yet so ripe for the picking. And all that happens after is set in motion so early. But I think you know all about that. I see it in your eyes when you lean in, 
wondering if I'm all here. We're not that dissimilar, are we, in our uniforms and our missions? In the lonely places we keep our disappointments and discouragements, our failings of faith and our flailings of soul because we have been taught and taught and now believe that we are, are only truly good when useful. I'm well past my usefulness, but still, I'm as awake to this world as an apple tree is to the sun. I've been a sapling and grown into blossom. I've borne fruit and lost it. I've been bowed by hard winds and regrew the limbs that snapped off or grew around them, accepting my new form. I've lived for the better part of a century and soon I will be dormant. We all have life cycles, the worms, the trees, and us. But you, you still have time. Tend your own gardens along with the sick and the dying, for surely I'm dying. Let's make no mistake about that. I have only one thing left unfinished. He would be tall like Alberto, handsome, dark, yes. When I laid eyes on beautiful Edward, I felt confused, I admit. My boy has only ever come to me in dreams and never smiling. Pack two. Dot tells me stuff. Have mercy on the motel managers, us front room folk, Dot said. We tend the moat before the castle. Dot Shamroll, lady of the motel office. Dot Shamroll, queen of these hinterlands, please give me the key to number nine. The walk in a trench under drippy eaves to a crummy, crummy room. Far flung flotsam on the sills and in that rug. I thought of the rise and fall of sewer overflow. I was supposed to sleep. I changed from my fleece to my bling, Dot said, describing her man. That was the thing, I changed from my fleece to my bling after he came in. I went out more, we played cards, Dot, Dot pointed inside. Later he didn't work much. Tending is such wonderful waste, I thought, the shower roaring in the drain, Dot in her tower wanting to explain. And the, this is the last one. Bike. Shut up already, she said. <laughs> Shove off. Pull yo on the hilly hill. Pull yo on the go-gone slope in the rain. Pull yo in the bloody blimey rain. She calmed her roll swerve down to the slot farm, silo toaster on the plains. Flinches and twitches in the go-round. The right accidental direction, girl in tow, yo. <laughs> Francis. Okay. I feel like I want to like, you know. Okay. Yes, Francis. Susan. Could you speak just a little bit for us okay. about what you mean by the definition arts instigator, which is in your bio, and how this relates to the founding of Hugo House and to the other projects that you've worked on? Wow. Cool. Okay. So an instigator is someone who stirs up uh, shenanigans, who lights <laughs> fires, who sets sparks in motion. And I'm really interested in that sort of high impact phase when people are starting projects or have a creative idea and they want to figure out how to move forward. And I also love um, connecting the wires of different people in different artistic enterprises. So. You know, sometimes that work is, uh, I did some work at Mohai, the Museum of History and Industry, when they were moving to the new museum, and they wanted to figure out how to kind of make uh, a more contemporary exhibit come alive. So I hosted storytelling sessions for people from different communities. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as sitting over butcher paper with someone and asking the right questions to help them plan an arts project. Um, and Hugo House, that's just crazy business. We had no <laughs> business doing that. <laughs> it was just um, the right uh, thing at the right time. And it's kind of a long story. I don't want to take up, you know, Jenny's time, but it's a good story, and I'll, I'll tell it to anybody um, who has, like, 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear it. Yeah, it's a good one. Okay. We'll hear it sometime. Yeah. yeah. Jenny. Yes, ma'am. As a founding member of Seattle Seven Writers who support literature and writing in our community, can you tell us something of its founding 
and how it came to support literary organizations, if that was there from the beginning or? Yeah, well, as all good things, they kind of often happen by happenstance and things continue to uh, emerge, just like with all the work Francis has done. So I was new to Seattle and um, I was asked to do a reading and the other, there were other readers who were gonna be there, other writers who were gonna be reading. One was Gar Stein who wrote a really famous book, but he had not yet written that really famous book. He'd written two other books that were about as famous as my books are. And uh, so we were, you know, we, we both read at this reading where the only person who came was my friend Karen, who's here tonight too. Oh, Karen! <laughs> yes, and our spouses. And um, after the reading, they actually made us go downstairs to our book table and stand there and sell books to each other. <laughs> so we did. So it was such a bonding moment for Garth and me that we uh, started having Aww. coffee monthly and um, just talking shop. You know, just that's what you got. You have to have someone else when you're a writer, as you all know. You have to have someone else you can talk to about it, not to share the writing necessarily, just to talk about the life of being a writer and being. And once you're published, then there's a whole another set of problems. Um, so we then started inviting other people to come join us over time, and, and pretty soon there were seven. And we stayed a, a group, a coffee clutch of about seven for quite a long time. And then Garth wrote the big famous book. <laughs> and he went on a big tour. And he really saw the value of taking uh, what we do in the world, and the platform we have, we can go out and we do readings and stuff, but we can do that and also do some good with it. Um, because we feel like we're just shills here. We're just like, we've got snake oil in our trunk and we're supposed to be selling our books. Um, but we can do things like raise money for something good. And we decided to incorporate as a nonprofit and raise money and awareness for the literacy organizations in this oh, community. And uh, we now have 70 members. Wow. Yay! Bravo. And one plug for the writers here, we are having our fifth annual, or sixth annual, um, right here, right now, one day writing intensive, February 7th. Such a fun day. It's a 45 minutes of writing every hour for everyone there, including the 20 published authors who will be there to help you, and then many lessons from them. Robert Schenken, the Pulitzer Prize and Tony Prize winning um, writer of All the Way and The Great Society is going to do our keynote. We have lots of great writers who are going to be teaching ask me about it or go to seattle7writers.org online. Wow. Thank you for letting me plug. Sure, of course. And let me just ask one follow-up. Is there a particular organization that your funding goes to? Do you change it every year? Who's your current project? Um, well, so what we do is we just kind of raise money all year and then what we have left in the bank at the end of every year, our very ragtag board gets together and we decide who to make grants to. Um, and we just kind of look at what's happening in the community that year, who might need a helping hand, who's been getting a little more, you know, we, it's, so it's, it's different every year. We've given to writers in the schools, powerful schools. Um, we've given to Recovery, not Recovery Cafe, but Path with Art, which is a, a, an organization for people recovering from homelessness and addiction through art. We've given to um, 826 Seattle, which just became the Bureau for Fearless Ideas. We've given to, um, Gosh, I can't remember, but several organizations in the community. And we just kind of rotate as to who's, who has need. Right now, this Bureau for Fearless Ideas is going to be making a big push and putting a writing center for kids into White Center. Wow. And we think Yay. that's really important, so we gave them our money this year. Cool. That's great. Excellent. Close wow. by to here. Yeah. <laughs> Francis. We've read, I think all of us have read, I know I've read for sure, and Katie has read, um, and deeply admired The Bled, mm -hmm. which won the Washington State Book Award a couple of years ago. Can you speak a little bit to what it's like to write from such a deeply personal space? And just a few years, and then a few years later, have the book published and out in the world. Mm -hmm. And then that's been a while now, so how do you relate to it now? And maybe tell people oh, who maybe haven't great. read it what, what a your great, subject um, is. That's a great question. Okay. Um, so The Bled is a book about my husband's accidental death while we were living in Marrakesh. And we had a 13-year-old daughter. And he fell on a basketball court and hit his head. And um, it's, you know, a complex thing. So the whole experience was very layered um, because he died in French and Arabic. You know, we were speaking French and Arabic and all the things around his death happened in these other languages. And um, the series of events also shot up kind of the American spine of uh, overseas um, 
uh, the Moroccans had a dead American on their hands, and the Americans had a dead American on their hands in Morocco, and Obama had just been elected. And things were a little bit more tense than I'd realized. I was a Fulbright scholar, so I was a low-level State Department employee. And I just tell you all this because it was very, there are a lot of layers to the story. So the tragedy is um, there's kind of a thickness to the events, you know, and the, the place is hot and the, you know, the situation is complex. Um, so anyway, you know, <clears throat> all I remember really, I mean, I remember all the events that, you know, and getting my daughter home and then going back and living there again. We went back after we buried Gary here, but all I remember actually doing that whole time for maybe six or eight months was uh, just writing poems. And I think it was like a, a sort of a compulsive dysgraphia, <coughs> like they say Faulkner had, where he couldn't physically stop writing. It was like some kind of weird tick and addiction. And for him, it really <laughs> worked out, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, so I just was filling up these yellow legal pads um, with poems, and then one of my friends, Dara Wire, I don't know if you read her poetry, she sort of did an intervention and said, what are you, what are you writing, give me, give me that. And then she looked at it and said, okay, um, I wanna put out a chapbook from this press called Factory Hollow, which is in Amherst, and that came like maybe only a few months or six months into that terrain after my husband had died. Is it okay I'm telling you this story? Are you guys yeah, freaking out? Please. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone's like, I think I need more coffee. Um, <laughs> wine. So, so, yeah, so liquor. Wine. Okay, <laughs> got back out. All right. Um, so this is where it gets kind of weird, like where the artifice of writing um, and the real, raw nature of writing collide because Dara read the poems I gave to her, and she called me, and she said, okay, um, I have another request, and I was like, okay, what? And she said, so I want you to make this into a whole book. Like, I want you to do, like, right now, in the next three or four months, a whole book of these poems. So it's like writing, you know, a full collection in six months, I think. So it was like, I was calling her the grief on demand kiosk. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, it's Dara. And my, my daughter goes, Dara's on the phone. I'm like, oh my God, it's the <laughs> grief on demand kiosk. <laughs> They're calling, you know. And um, she was exactly right. Because it was the, you know, some people exercise, some people cook, some people obsess over, I don't know what they do. When bad things happen, you just turn to the things you know how to do. And honestly, all I know how to do is run, literally, like out in the terrain, and write poems. And so that's exactly what I did. And so, you know, I came up with the uh, poems, and then I sent them to Dara, and then they became the bled. And the bled um, is uh, comes from the Arabic word baladi, uh, which means land, and sometimes it means hinterland. And then when the French colonized Morocco, they appropriated the word bladi and made it bled, le bled, which now in French means either bad neighborhood or shitty hinterland. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I really liked that because of the play also on the language levels that I was kind of, kind of navigating at the time. And so the bled was about what had happened to my husband and all those references to the bled and then this kind of trying to navigate a strange hinterland of both language and place that was just pressing down constantly. So now when um, people say, oh, I've read The Bled, I nervously answer, oh my God, that book should have crime tape on it. <laughs> you know, like there should be a little scene, like a little crime scene around it, and The Bled should be in the middle, like, I don't know, like careful what you're going into, you know. <laughs> So I don't know if you guys have seen Anna Hamilton's show at the Henry, yeah. where she makes these little taxidermy mementos into like kind of little autopsy rooms, you know? And it should kind of be served like that, maybe with a bottle of something awkwardly taped to it. <laughs> so, you can. 
So, I mean, I kind of just, um, I, I've gotten over, like, apologizing when people say, oh, I read the bullet, I go, I'm so sorry. You know? <laughs> it's my first response, because the book is crafted like a novel. I mean, it has a, it has a pace to it, and I think a resolution, and um, so now I look at it, and I'm kind of curious, at, like, what was that space I was in? Like, what was that madness? that I lived in where the only resource I had was pulling on what I knew about crafting language. So, thanks for asking. I've never answered that before. That was really nice of you to ask that. It's Thank a beautiful you. answer. You yeah. should never apologize. Never. Yeah, no more apologize. No My, more yeah, apologize. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to ask Jenny one more question, and then we're going to do something to hopefully elicit some questions from all of you. Um, I am suspecting with your output that you're a full-time writer now, and I'm wondering if there was a profession that you transitioned from, and if you can talk a little bit about what it's like to be a full-time mm -hmm. writer. Um, yes. Joyous, difficult, complicated? <laughs> Look at her face. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was I was a kid who left home early at 17, so I didn't go to college. So I started making a living at 17, and um, so I had so many jobs. Mm -hmm. And I started writing full time at 35, 20 years ago. So it, I had such a, a funny, you know, I was a plumber, I was a cook in restaurants, uh -huh. like cafes, kind of things. I was I worked at a, in a health food store with my friend Karen when we were like 19, 20. I, um, but then I found myself in kind of this uh, marketing advertising career for a long time, for about 10 years. And uh, it was a good way to make money, and it was, uh, I was good at it. And so, but by the end of 10 years there, I had just completely, um, my soul was dead and dried up, and I knew there was something better. So uh, I left work at 35. I was married by then, and we arranged it so I could. And I just started casting about for what my life was going to be. And um, thank goodness, I, uh, I'd always written, I loved writing, I'd written, I'd been, you know, my family were great readers, my uh, mom and my three sisters and I just read like crazy. So it all is fairly innate in there. Um, but I wrote a little weird opinion piece to the Rocky Mountain News, I lived in Denver, that I was really angry at this male columnist who had said something really sexist and misogynistic. And so I wrote an answer, a response, and um, the editor called me and said, we're gonna publish your piece. I'm like, oh, and she said, and we're going to pay you $25. I go, oh, I knew I had, I was going to be a writer. And that's how it all began. So long, arduous journey from there. But um, so yes, yeah, so I've, I've really um, worked very hard at being a writer for that entire 20 years. I was a magazine freelancer for a long time, always writing fiction in the background. And yes, it can be joyous. Yes, it can suck. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I hate it. Yes, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, sometimes I feel like sometimes I know what I'm doing. It's just, it's a mad, crazy world, as I think every writer in the room understands, just by the process of trying to craft something that you hope others will want to read. Um, that's what life is like. And then when, once we had uh, Seattle 7 going, that's really become my part-time job as well. So trying to, to make that all work together. Yeah. How's your writing life? I would love to know that. <laughs> <laughs> My writing life happens in between grading those papers. In those papers, yeah. A lot at Christmas and a lot right. in the summer. I yeah. got you. So you have to do the batches of writing. Right. right. And right. sabbaticals. Sabbaticals are sort of oh, nice. very lovely. Oh. You know, just come off one. Nice. So questions from the audience. We have something to try to get you um, a little bit more active this time. Chocolate. These are chocolates from oh. Hawaii. Oh. <laughs> Ask a question, get a chocolate. <laughs> and Jenny will toss one to you. You'll <laughs> open your mouth. <laughs> I might bring it to you. Uh, uh, yeah, Any right. questions Anything from them? Anything at all. This is your free time. What's your favorite color? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have chocolate. <laughs> bring it over. It deserves a chocolate. <laughs> oh, what's your favorite color? Yellow. Yellow. Yeah, yellow. Yellow. Yeah. yellow. Yeah. yellow. Yeah. yellow. Yeah. yellow. Yeah. I thought so. I'm, when I'm an old woman, it's always purple. purple. Yeah. <laughs> oh, another question. I have, I have a question. So the novel that you read from tonight, does, does it have a title? It's probably really bad for the film. Uh, it does not yet have a title. I will throw them from here on up. It does not have a title. 
Um, for me, titles come way after the end of the book. I always have a working title that kind of sucks, and the publisher always says no. And so then I write like hundreds and hundreds of titles trying to come up with one, and then um, at some point it all gels for me. This one probably won't for a long time. I really like the what you read. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Good question. This is uh, for Francis. I think it's the only one that applies to you. Can you talk a little bit about um, writing and being a mom and how you negotiate those oh, two yeah. okay. demanding jobs? Okay, here's the hardest um, triangle I think you can live in is when you're the breadwinner artist solo parent. Ooh. <laughs> I went through like the last five years, like every time someone says, I have this job, would you like? And I go, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, so that's pretty hard. Um, I would say that what, I mean, I'm, this is gonna sound sort of pithy and I don't know, maybe just cheesy, but um, the best thing that I did, I think, was that I set up the, the house. We live in a little house where everything is parallel play. So like my daughter at night would sit at this table and do homework, and I would sit in this red chair and write. Mm -hmm. And then every now and then we'd look up and we'd go, oh, listen to this, or something like mm -hmm. that. And like establishing that rhythm without screens and televisions and mm -hmm. things going off, just mm -hmm. that really calm, space and she didn't know then but she knows that now that all those nights I was actually working you know I was getting paid by the hour to do some gig while I was sitting in that chair mm -hmm. but to her it just felt really calm and um, easy going so I mean I guess that's so those are freelance writing gigs or, or, or editing or arts instigator gigs um, yeah all kinds of things and for your creative work do you have to be by yourself well, here's the real truth. When I write prose, I'm a moron. And so I, it takes me like, I need five hours of uninterrupted time. And I need almost headphones to block out the leaf blowers or, or whatever. I took Jenny to lunch to ask her about narrative arc, because I'm like in paralysis on this prose project I'm working on. And, and she totally helped me. But anyway, I do need that kind of block of time. So I, I some days when I'm not teaching, I get up at you know, six and try to write until one in the afternoon and then pack everything else into the last nine hours of the day. But my daughter is now a freshman at college. Ooh, wow. So it's, yeah. yeah, it's really pretty wild. Like, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Is your daughter thinking about being a writer herself? No, she thinks creative writing is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, why would you make stuff up? She's a visual artist. Yeah, she's a painter, so. Yeah. Yeah. Laurie? Just a question about, you're both heavily involved in the community and you know fostering community connections. I don't need chocolates, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, I just got a crown. So. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise. I'm a little sensitive. Um, uh, in so many ways. Um, I'm going to cry. And you've mentioned a little bit about the value of having a sounding board in other writers. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about when you were kind of first starting out, who you considered mentors, either in personal association and or people that you looked up to to kind of model your aspirations? Mm -hmm. okay. Want to take that one, Jenny? I'll, well, you can also answer. Okay. You know, really, there's no one in the beginning because you don't even know who to look to. Um, there, oh, were, there, were, there were books. Mm -hmm. There were many, many books. Um, I had a fifth grade teacher who told me my stories were important. That was one. Um, I had a lot of teachers that just ignored me. You know, so until I moved to Portland and I was from Denver, I moved to Portland, a novel that was going nowhere, suddenly was going to get published, and I went to something where all these authors were going to be selling their books, and I was telling one of them, April Henry, who's a lovely mystery writer, YA mystery writer down in Portland, I'm getting a book published. And she took me under her wing and became my Aww. first mentor. She just immediately said, She's we're going amazing. to lunch. She said, I'm taking you to lunch because there's so much you have to know. Aww. So that was the beginning of it. And she was so yeah. generous. Um, and then, you know, everyone, when once you start to meet people, you know, you, you learn how generous they are. So that's, mm -hmm. it's Can hard. Can you say some of those books? That, do you remember any of them that were important in the beginning? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, from the time I was, you know, six. Um, but for me, the ones that were really 
the ones that made me know I wanted to be a writer were when I was a teenager and in my early 20s probably. And Well, first of all, I read every Glimmer Train cover to cover, all the short stories. Mm, I smart. subscribed when they first started. Um, and then, um, mm -hmm. but I read all the women. I was, you know, I'm a child of the almost 60s, 70s, and I read Barbara Kingsall of her early books, and I read mm. all the Alices, and I read, you know, um, just whatever I could get my hands on. I loved Ruby, Ruby for Jungle, Rita Mae Brown, before she was a <laughs> kitty mystery writer. I loved, I just loved stories that women wrote, John Irving, just stories about people, um, because I came from a family with mental illness, and I knew that my family was weird, and so when you read novels, you understand that everybody's family is weird. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I really gravitated toward, were um, really great novels about families who are, who are, and people who are doing the best they can in spite of circumstances, so. Hmm. How about you? Well, um, I have sort of a, um, I can't think of a literal mentor, but I can think of an imagined one that left, led me on an adventure. Um, one day, I went to the University of New Hampshire, and one day I was standing outside the library having a cigarette. I was 19, kind of shaggy, stonerish, baggy, khakis, ripped flannel shirt. You get the picture. I see it. Yeah. <laughs> and a farm truck drove up with a blue tarp and some wagon gates, you know, banging around. And I heard this librarian come out and say, oh, that's the Frost Papers. And I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, Robert Frost Papers are being delivered from Derry. And I was like, in this farm truck today, like, you know, watching this thing. And it was like, um, from that image, I think that led me all these years to be completely obsessed with archives and papers and things that are the residue of writers' intentions, which is kind of how I ended up writing the Richard Hugo book. Then the second thing that happened also there was I found a book in the library at random at the University of New Hampshire, our teacher said, go find a poetry book written by someone alive. And I wandered the stacks and found this book by William Stafford. And he lived in Oregon. And I kept saying, Oregon, it rained, Oregon. And um, then I ended up, uh, not very long after that, like three years later, driving west in search of William Stafford. And then I ended up in the middle of the night, parked outside of his Rambler in Lake Oswego, Oregon, with my then boyfriend going, I mean, really? I mean, really? He's just like, and I was sitting there going, he's up there, and he's going to get up soon, and he's going to write, just like he says. Just like he says, and you must, you know, revise your life or in writing the Australian crawl. And it was just like a miracle to me that a person who wrote beautiful poems could live in a rambler. <laughs> I was just like, damn, that is like amazing. So anyway, that was really important. That doesn't answer your question, but you know. So did you see the light turn on at 6 a.m.? I didn't, because my boyfriend grew bored and yawny, and so we had to leave. <laughs> There's more chocolates here. Francis, me too. Would you mind saying one thing that inspired you uh, about Richard Hugo? Oh, man, there's so many things. Just one. Just one. Just one. <laughs> he didn't have his shit together at all. Okay. He wasn't uh, put together, you know, kind of a feet beret wearing, uppity <laughs> poet. He was a disheveled man who worked at Boeing and had issues. And I find that inspiring. Yeah. Very, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like a wonderful note to end uh -huh. on. <laughs>